Okay. Sounds like we're at a um, German fiesta. <laughs> good morning, everyone. So, so good to see you. And I'm coming to you live from the campus at Naval Postgraduate School on a wonderful foggy day for those of you who are melting on the East Coast. Sorry about that. You got to come out, visit once in a while. So this morning, uh, just a couple of announcements but before we get to Chris and Thomas and Dan. I uh, just wanted to let you know that after a summer hiatus, the alumni hour is now uh, in full gear. We'll be doing the third Thursday of every month, uh, with the exception of December, of course, for the holidays. So uh, we invite you to uh, send me any ideas of folks that you think would be interesting for our alumni to listen to. And uh, if you uh, just send me an email, I'll be happy to talk that over with you. Uh, some other things to know, this week you'll get watermark in the mail. This is our biggest issue yet. We can't wait for you to see it. Of course, a lot of you are in it. So uh, uh, let me know what you think. And uh, also, I'm always open to ideas on, on articles and features. I know you're not shy. So uh, let's do some fun stories together. And then third, and the best news of all, is uh, I want to introduce our new interim director. She's not new to many of you, but uh, Jody Stiles is uh, serving as our interim director while we do a national search. With that, I'll turn it over to Jody. Thanks, Heather. Not much to say this morning. I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much to, to everyone in the community who's just reached out to offer uh, Congratulations and well wishes. Um, it's really important to me and really important to the center. So thanks for that. And uh, um, just happy to be here uh, moving things forward as we search for the permanent director. I know a few of you have asked about that. The job posting will be out shortly and we'll make sure that everybody in the community is aware of, of that when that happens. So stay tuned for that. Um, but most importantly, I just want to thank all of you for being here today and for attending these alumni hours. Um, you know, we're so busy in our regular work week, it's really hard to prioritize education. Um, I think all of you are really good at prioritizing education because you've done it just by nature of being an alum of our programs. But, you know, on a weekly basis, it's hard to do. So thanks for jumping in when you're busy. I know at the end of the hour, we're all super glad that we uh, took the time to listen and discuss, um, but it's hard to, to do that ahead of time. So thanks for joining in. I'm, it's a great conversation today, and I hope to see you all at Apex so we can do more of this um, over three days instead of just one hour. But thanks, Heather, and I'll, um, I'll turn it back to you to introduce everybody. I don't think Chris Bellavita needs an introduction to any of us. As I think his influence is rooted in most of our um, thought processes and the way we think about uh, homeland security in the world these days. But uh, welcome to Chris and welcome to, to Dr. Uh, and author Thomas Barnett too. So Heather, back to you. Chris didn't want me to do an intro with a special title, so I'm going to give him one on my own. And that is our Yoda, Dr. Chris Bellavita, who's been so uh, intrinsically involved with everything having to do with the quality of education here at CHDS. <clears throat> uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you, Heather, uh, and, and thank then, you, thank you for comparing me to a fictional character. <laughs> the ideal wisdom—that's what I'm trying to say, Chris. So uh, here's also Dan O'Connor, who is uh, a graduate of every program we offer, with the exception of Rep and Pelp. So uh, Dan is is one of those guys that if I need something written or uh, thought about, I like to tap into his extensive knowledge and history. He's He's been very easy to work with and, and uh, just a treasure for, for CHDS as well. He is uh, the field operations director for FEMA, but uh, also uh, has the title of most programs graduated from, from CHDS. So uh, welcome, Dan. Thank you, Heather. So uh, our, our guest today is uh, Dr. Thomas Barnett. Uh, Thomas is an author. Uh, an academic, a strategist. He is responsible for over 500 uh, publications. Uh, he writes in the tradition of the grand narratives. Uh, think of uh, the class of uh, civilizations, the end of history. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Porter and Mickleby's National Strategic Narrative uh, that, that 
uh, that level of uh, a vision of, uh, in this case, where the next century uh, ought to go or could go anyway. Um, he's the author also of the 2004 Pentagon's new map. And uh, as happens with anybody who attempts to have big picture views of the globe, uh, that book was received with praise. One of the reviewers called it an elegant vision of global peace and also some scorn. Another reviewer called it uh, evil garbage. So Tom writes somewhere in, in, in the midst of, of that. His new book, America's New Map, is the subject for our conversation today. And uh, thanks for being here today, Tom. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Uh, this book is, in effect, uh, an attempt at enunciating a grand strategy for the United States in light of these two massive structural changes that we're experiencing right now, which is uh, climate change and the demographic transition that the world in total is going through, but specifically the demographic collapse that is occurring already to our stunned amazement in places like China and, of course, following uh, the course of Italy and Japan before it. I'm going to give you a bottom line up front, my basic argument. U.S.-style globalization has transformed the world. It has accelerated, turbocharged climate change. We wouldn't be here without U.S.-style globalization because of all the uptick in human activity that's come about since we instituted it uh, following the Second World War. To join globalization is to undergo a demographic transition. That's the price. That's the ticket cost. And what we've done, the most amazing thing uh, coming out of U.S.-style globalization is the creation of a majority global middle class. My entire life, I was told this was never going to happen. Just impossible. And yet it has happened. And in many ways, the global majority middle class becomes the center dynamic, central dynamic of globalization going forward. This is why we're hearing about the global south more and more. And we're hearing about how the global south isn't all that interested in the global north's agenda. All three of these things are strong impetus. Uh, impeti, I guess, impeti, impetus uh, to north-south integration, which is the big structural change that's going to be expressed across this century. Climate change is going to hit the lower latitudes more than the upper latitudes. Demographic transitions, you got still fertile south, a demographically collapsing north, and then that majority global middle class largely located in the global south. So the course of globalization Connectivity right now, a lot of it is north connecting to south. There is a regionalization imperative going on in our current iteration, the digitalization of globalization. Now that China has risen, we're starting to see consolidation along hemispheric and regional lines. That makes sense. And there's going to be a super brand, superpower brand competition for the allegiance, economic, political, ideological, security of that majority global middle class. And we're already starting to see that. I would argue Xi and Putin are very much pushing this superpower brand competition with the global South, and that America is behind the curve on this one. So I'm describing massive structural changes, any one of which would dominate this century, all three happening at the same time. They're largely gonna play out over the next half century. That means, though, we're entering into a zone of, uh, zone of turbulence that is going to force accelerated evolutions throughout humanity. Scientists will tell you species around the world today are being asked by climate change to evolve 10,000 times faster than normal. Okay, if we evolve even five times faster than normal in the political sense, that's not evolution, that's revolution. So I'm arguing we all go into this black box, we come out the other side, we look differently everybody's going to have to adjust dramatically. It's not about power. It's about adaptation. I'm going to tell you the Western Hemisphere is advantaged in this quest. The East, far less advantaged, really disadvantaged along many lines. So that, again, nobody comes out looking the same on the far side of this, which means we're going to have a very different American Union if we want to remain the centerpiece of a global power structure, which I think is within our grasp. And this notion of a second American century, entirely plausible, not because we don't have it hard, but because other people have it harder. Quick thought experiment. 
we're all familiar with uh, national sports here in America, the concept of free agency after a season ends. Okay. Imagine citizens, communities, states, provinces, oblasty, nation states themselves. Let's say the structures come down one day and you can sign with whatever franchise you want to attach yourself to. Let's name those five franchises as China, India, the United States, EU, and Russia. My question, once the signings are complete, who's got a bigger roster? Who's got more brand loyalty? Who's got more stars on their flag? And who has fewer? Who may even disappear in this process? Through line one, coming to grips with this creation called globalization. Here's a map of the United States, countries assigned to US states based on similar GDP. And then we note the difference in population. Canada equal to New York's GDP, twice the population. Brazil equates to Texas, seven times the population. India equates to California, 36 times the population. This map is designed to get you to realize that what we have in this 50 member state union is the freest form of trade, the freest form of people movement, of financial movement. We don't count Wisconsin's foreign direct investment in Indiana. We don't count uh, California selling to Texas. If we did, our trade numbers would be off the charts. They still do that in the EU. They count France and Germany, their trade or foreign direct investment in one another. So what you're looking at here is basically the reality that America is the avatar of globalization. It is its purest expression, its oldest practice. We are the world's oldest and most successful multinational republic. We came along long before the EU. We are, in effect, globalization in miniature. And we're still the bleeding edge of this process to include a racial mixing that is very difficult to process politically, socially, economically. This story begins with FDR after the Second World War. The United States wants to project its rules, its internal rules of integration upon the world. We alter the structure on the left there. We alter the norms. We had that power. We didn't have to do it. But it was our notion that by doing it, we would end world wars. And we were correct. Along with nuclear weapons, that's what did it. Okay? By 1980, one quarter of humanity vastly outproducing the rest. Quickly attracts the emulation from the East. Deng Xiaoping, in the most momentous decision of the 20th century, decides to marketize China. Right around then, we start talking for the first time in history of a global economy, a true global economy, which later becomes this concept of globalization. I'm telling you, none of this was an accident. I'll also tell you, all the arms racing, all the proxy wars, all the threat of nuclear ar Armageddon, all of that, by and large, irrelevant to this competition. This was a competition between two forms two proto-forms of globalization, the West versus the Soviet bloc. Our model prevailed. Theirs disappeared. So vanquished it was by our competitive lead. Second through line, this massive outcome from all this economic and human activity unleashed by US-style globalization since roughly 1950. It changes everything. You go back to my Pentagon's new map, I talk about the shape in the middle there, the non-integrating gap. My notion back then, 20 years ago, was that the velocity of globalization penetrating these traditional societies was destabilizing, was creating a lot of unrest, insurgency, terrorist activity, terrorist responses. I'm still looking at the same slice, equatorially centric. I'm just drawing some lines and saying, that horizontal world, east-west, now becomes a vertical world, north-south. 
So we have thought longitudinally throughout history for a long time, going all the way back to your Jared Diamond, wide Eurasia, wide Eurasia beats tall uh, Western Hemisphere, beats tall Africa. So the wide parts of the world conquer the tall parts of the world. Now it's different. Now it's advantageous to be tall because you can spread yourself out in response to all the damage climate change is going to do to lower latitudes. So here's my argument about our responsibility. This is what we had in terms of extreme poverty mid last century. We got it down to this. Absolutely amazing. The global middle class, a mere fraction back then, so we could be very wasteful in, how, in terms of how we use resources. Now we're approaching two thirds and we have to rethink our resource utilization across the board. This is a massive structural change, okay? In this process, we have reformatted the bulk of the planet's landscape. We now outlift Mother Nature tenfold on an annual basis. We're more powerful than erosion. And we put a trillion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Basically, the weight of every structure on Earth today combined. We've also changed the acidity level of the ocean. So we have changed the land, we have changed the air, we have changed the water. On that basis, scientists date the so-called Anthropocene back to when we started blowing off nukes, which makes sense because nukes enabled this kind of system to develop first in the free world and West ultimately to spread globally to be called globalization. And that globalization has altered the planet, has literally reformatted our entire planet. So we all fly, we look down, we see how we've altered this planet. There's no question, we're living in the human epic. In the book, I came to a conclusion that I was stunned to write, and I, I'm stunned every time I say it. But I make the argument. Our identity as Americans is the most important identity any of us will ever have. We will have many identities. In fact, we're living in an age of very fractured, multiplying identities. Okay? But the one that's mattered throughout history is the fact that we're Americans and that our behavior individually and collectively altered the planet like this. Absolutely amazing. But as Spider-Man would say, great power, great responsibility. We have triggered the greatest resource transfer in human history. All species moving poleward. Stunning. All species moving up in elevation. So whether you believe in climate change or not, the animals and the species around the world are telling us what's real. You have to evolve, evolve 10,000 times the normal speed. Guess what? The smaller you are and the more rapidly procreative you are, the more you can adapt. So pathogens win in this environment dramatically. Then there's the issue of climate velocity. I grew up in Wisconsin. I saw maybe a dozen rainbows or two dozen in my life growing up there as a kid. Moved out east for four decades, came back. Saw two dozen rainbows in the first month in Madison, Wisconsin. I looked around and said, what the hell's happened? It's like somebody moved somebody else's weather here. Now, what I was seeing was not crazy. Not the what. I can go to Hawaii and get that all year round. It's the where. It's the fact that climates have moved around the planet. My favorite example, well, uh, wheat belt, North America. Heading north 25 kilometers a year meaning we will farm and harvest wheat outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, mid-century. That gives you a sense of the elemental resource wealth transfer here. Because it's all about land. Roughly two Australias, 15 million kilometers square of land in the lower latitudes is going to disappear thanks to climate change. It just won't be there anymore. It'll be transformed into unlivable, unarable. Meanwhile, roughly the same amount is going to appear in the upper quadrant 
of the planet, the new north. Okay, no money's changing hands. This is the biggest resource transfer in human history. And if you live in the global south and the global north is largely responsible for climate change, you are mightily angered. Everybody's heading towards the pole. This is a drawing from the book. The book has a lot of drawings and illustrations. So here's a map of the world in terms of how bad it's going to be if you are prepared. You can see it looks darker in the middle, across the width. This is what it looks like if you're not ready. And what you see here is going east or west, which is the historic response of humanity, it doesn't make any sense. You're not changing anything going east or west. You change things by going north and south, just like all those species. So I'm describing what I call in the book Middle Earth, 30 degrees north and south of the equator, more than 50% of humanity. It's where the bulk of future global middle-class growth and consumption is going to be. But we're also talking about the same space where three to five billion people are going to face unlivability by mid-century. I argue the superpower competition of the 21st century is who best integrates their respective South. So this long-term reality, East-West, which is how we structure everything we think about in national security, quite frankly. We don't talk North-South. We're not interested in North-South. We don't really fear North-South. We think it's an immigration thing. It's a policy issue. It's not strategy. That changes and it's changing all around us. And we of older generations can deny it and blow it off. I tell you, millennials and Gen Zs don't. They're the ones running this place 2050. So let's talk North South and this Middle Earth problem. The South presents risk translating into need. The North, with most of the power, looks at this fundamentally as a cost issue for now, are we going to pay reparations? Our goal is to limit impact and boost resilience across Middle Earth. We can do it economically, traditionally, official developmental aid. Good luck with that. Not a great record. Better foreign direct investment, but that money only goes where it feels comfortable. So how do you make it feel comfortable down there? Your goal is to have government survival so people stay. When there's government failure, we're talking threats perceived more than posed, and we're talking responses. Some will just go from land to urban. Some will just go the one country over. A whole lot are still going to be left over to come north. Then it's a political response. Do we repel Saudi security forces massacred hundreds of Ethiopian immigrants escaping an eight-year mega drought in that country as they came over the border from Yemen. Italian Coast Guard let a ship full of hundreds of migrants, most of them climate migrants, sink and drown in the Med. We are experiencing repel now. Or we resettle. And there, I cite that reality. Two Australias disappearing in one part of the world, opening up in another. Historically, that's a mass migration. So I'm talking about a whole government response here. Ultimately, the lure, just like the EU has used in Eastern Europe, is an accession track to eventual membership in larger unions. They can be defined all sorts of ways, politically, economically, currency-wise, freedom of movement-wise. The EU has a variety of overlapping memberships. The goal is to socialize the underlying hemispheric risk. You're going to care about your neck of the woods because you're going to feel your pain, their pain, excuse me, in your neck of the woods. So the United States is not going to worry about Southeast Asia. China is. The United States is going to worry about Latin America. The goal is to create legal certainty for that FBI flow. You want to extend security networks. You want to maximize the staying population. And yes, Let's think defensively, summon our inner Monroe Doctrine. We'd rather not see the Chinese running Latin America. So a harsh image, but we are talking about 
that chunk of the world basically experiencing temperature ranges, precipitation ranges, historically associated with the Saharan Desert. What do we know about the Saharan Desert? Weak governments, lots of bad actors, little economic activity, not very populated. We can take a break here, Chris, if you want, or keep going. Tom, I think we should keep going. I'm not seeing very many questions on the chat. Uh, All right. So let's keep going. Third through line, demographics. I'm going to explain the demographic transition because I find a lot of people hear demographic dividend. They don't really understand it. And it's, it's important to understand it in a very basic way. Okay, here's your phases. On the left, we've got a high birth rate and a high death rate. That's less developed country. On the far right, we got low birth rate, low death rate. That's an advanced country. Okay, so Soylent Green, upper left, children of men, lower right. Rural, upper left, urban, lower right. Pre-modern, upper left, developed, lower right. How you get from left to right is called the demographic transition. It happens when the death rate goes down, especially among zero to five age range. This is accomplished by better access to uh, care, uh, care uh, better nutrition for mothers. And then the, the big one, the King Kong of this whole thing is vaccines. That's how you get babies to age five. Once you start getting babies to age five, you don't need so many babies. It takes a while for this to settle in. They tend to procreate at the rural rate, even though they've moved into the city. But eventually the birth rate comes down. And in that lag is a natural increase. The pig that's going to be swallowed by this python. At first, it's a baby boom. Everybody loves it. Then it's a youth bulge, scares the hell out of everybody. Crime, revolution, terrorism, the 60s. Then it becomes a demographic dividend. Lots of workers relative to dependents. Ultimately, you age out and you start stockpiling old people. My point is, everybody that's made the climb to the top has gone through this. We call these things age pyramids because historically, they've always looked like this. This is pre-modernity. This is human history until very recently. It's a pyramid because you got lots of babies, very few old people. Okay, this is South Korea, 1950. Fast forward to 75, you can see that youth bulge starting to appear. Fast forward to 2005, bingo. You're killing it economically. This future, we don't exactly know about because nobody's ever gotten there before. Wild packs of wolves should hunt these people down in large numbers and thin the herd. But we're above that. So my history of globalization is America comes out of the Second World War demographically and industrially unharmed. At that point, we were going to rule the global economy forever. America was great. It was never going to end until we got superseded by the Japanese who had a 30-year boom in population. Then the Japanese were going to rule the world. Some of us are old enough to remember when that was going to be absolutely true. Until the Chinese emerged with an even bigger demographic dividend, about 300 million. Then they were going to rule the world forever. Now, all of a sudden, doesn't look like it. The shift to Southeast Asia, well underway, their demographic boom, about 400 million. On the heels, you're starting to see these arguments and forecasts already. India's the future. India will be the future for a good 15 to 20 years. And then it'll be superseded by the Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, about a billion, twice the demographic dividend of India. There's your history of globalization. The last in integrates the next up. It's accomplished largely by cashing out with foreign direct investment. Okay, that's how you slot in your replacement lower on the value chain so you can move up the value chain to higher end goods and intellectual property. China's the major integrator now because China has been the major saver in the system last three decades. Okay, everybody cheats their way to the top. Once they get there, they start caring about the rules. When I show you China's Belt and Road map, 
super and opposing on top of this reality, you can see why they're doing it. They're following the demographic dividend. It's not just the resources. It's not just the oil. They're following the demographic dividend. They want to slot them into their value chains, which means they need infrastructure, transportation, and they want to capture that middle class because this is a vast chunk of humanity that has lived for eternity almost on unprocessed, unpackaged, unbranded goods, which is now heading into middle class consumption status. And we know from your first car to your first presidential vote, when you get hooked on a brand and your loyalty is attached to it, in many instances, you stick with it for life. So the future of the planet in terms of economic competition, you're looking at it. I'm going to break just for a second here to bring out one of the threads from this through line. And that is to note that America is currently on an unprecedented journey. I hail from the mid of the 20th century. Back then, America was 90% white. That was our peak white period. We started off with 80% in 1790 and then slowly rose to 90%. Then we opened up the immigration gates, stopped with the uh, source country formula. So we kept America white from the 1920s to the 1960s. We started to let the rest of the world in. And what we have seen since is the rapid decline of the white population, which has been preeminent, which has been the central identity of the country. And quite frankly, this journey is freaking us out. I would argue every culture war you can name at its core is about this. The targets are different all the time but it's all about this. No country's ever made this journey. And yet it's indicative of what the world's going through. If whites in America fear they're being displaced, losing their centrality, losing their privilege, the West, particularly the United States, is feeling the same about all those issues in regard to globalization. Future of globalization, just like the future of America, is gonna be mostly non-white. And that is very, very, socially challenging. I will tell you though, the least racist superpower wins this competition, wins the North-South integration challenge. And I'm gonna argue that's gonna be us. So that global well, middle but, class- uh, Tom, Tom, if we go. could stop there, we got a couple of questions. Dan, you wanna Let's take it? it? Sure, Chris. Some some of these questions I'll combine because they're they're just superb. Uh, you know, Tom, that you or Tom, sorry. You know, you you broach a lot of things that have interconnectivity and sure. supposition based on data points. Mm -hmm. Um, what if there is great upheaval in in the BRICS? So if if for example, you said Indio's reign will be about twenty years, we see the the declination of demography and. And Russia and China's current crisis is how how do you superimpose your your thesis on top of some of these demographic trends, and then how do you combine that with you say poverty's coming down, but debt is inversely going up? Are these things that we can account for, or are these just kind of the the data points that need different perspectives? Yeah, I'm I'm less impressed with the debt argument. Because uh, quite frankly, that's an abstraction it, it, for the most part. It's an abstraction of value. And we can decide, just like China can decide with all the debt that it, its provinces have, China can just decide to declare a haircut. you know. And we've done that throughout history with great financial crises. So I don't spend a lot of time on the, on the debt issue. I will say with Russia, for example, um, you know, it feels like a predator right now. Demographically, I think it's a prey. You know, I think there's a lot of players that are going to look very ravenously at Russia's opening up of land and its lack of population, which has been the, 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 the bane of the Russian empire throughout its history. It just isn't coherent enough to kind of keep its, its reality together. I think uh, Russia could easily be dismembered across this century. Um, I think China is going to be willing to let people in over time, just like the Japanese are beginning to learn. But the Japanese may be, you know, the ultimate bellwether for refusing to do that. 
And I keep my eye on them for that reason, because if America ever were to go truly Christian white nationalist, let's say, and, and kind of reduce our perspective to that identity, I mean, we would be embracing a path that Japan's on very rapidly. So all these things, you know, are in play. China's very much in play. China's going to shift from that kind of extensive growth uh, to intensive growth. They've been selling public property and, and on that basis, creating a real estate boom that has driven their economy for quite some time. America did the same thing with its Western lands. Okay. And then we closed that frontier and we had to come up with a new frontier. I think China's going to come up with a new frontier. I, I don't buy this argument they're going to disappear or collapse. They're way too smart and they're way too proud and they have way too many resources for it to fall apart. Russia, Russia, I do think can very much fall apart post Putin because I could easily see a very distributed political structure, all trying to re-globalize with the outside world, taking in a lot of foreign direct investment and basically being captured by outside powers like the EU, like India, like China. Uh, another, go ahead, I'm sorry, one, go ahead. One more, and then let's get to the fourth line. Go ahead. Dan. Sure. Uh, and it's it's a combination question again because it works well. You know, you, you broach the idea, it's a euphemism, brand identity, and you're combining elements of patriotism and to some extent nationalism. When you compare the middle class, quote unquote, middle class across the world, the American way of life in the middle class is vastly different in terms of yes. requirements and expectations than the world. So from your perspective, can you define what you declare as middle class and how yeah. you see... The United States and its brand and its transition and patriotism, uh, absorbing that, adapting to that, et cetera. Sure, sure. I don't go off of uh, GDP measured in constant dollars. I, I do that uh, purchasing power parity measure. So it's like, you know, what does it really cost to have a Big Mac anywhere in the world? That kind of thing. So similarities. And, and so, yes, when you look at along those lines, we're talking about a different middle class, but it's a middle class that feels very similarly about their lot as the American middle class feels, even though the American middle class is a couple of cuts above it. OK, when we measure a global middle class, we're talking about four thousand dollars in spending capacity per person per year. In America, the standards more like eleven thousand. OK, now that eleven thousand reflects the boomers and Gen X. OK, talk to any millennial today and they will tell you. And I've had this response to this brief time and time again from millennials. They say, buddy, I'm already living your global middle class standard of living. OK, I'm not going to do what my parents did up at that 11,000 rate. I'm at a much lower rate and I'm adjusting on that basis. So I would argue the disparity between our middle class and the emerging global middle class that haircut is going to be largely applied to the millennials and Gen Zs. And they know it. And they're not too happy about it. And they blame the boomers extensively, especially on the question of debt. So, I mean, we got this kind of adjustment going on inside our country generationally. Um, it's not the adjustment in the rest of the world. I mean, it's a come down for the Europe. It's a come down for America. But the kind of middle class existence that China is selling around the world, it is not a come down for the world. It is a vast step up. And what their success is in this competition is effectively commoditizing prosperity, peace, and security and telling the world, you know what? Our version of this is just as good as the Americans. Our authoritarian version of this is just as good as the democratic version. In fact, Look at our record in the last 20 years and look at the crap those crazy people in the West are doing. Look how they're self-immolating. Look how they're burning themselves up over all sorts of weird stuff none of us understand. And that commoditization argument where China says, let us come in with Belt and Road, let us come in with safe cities, Huawei, Hype Vision, all that kind of stuff. It is a hell of a sale. And, and we think the debt issue is going to get them. I don't think we're understanding the threat or the attraction of the offer. They offer protection from tomorrow. The West does not. Um, that are. sounds like a good uh, transition into uh, through line four. Okay, we're rolling. We are rerunning an experiment, okay? 
your social classes. This is what you want them to look like. Small, special interests, left and right, big, fat, middle. Okay? You could try to rule the middle class from the left. You could try to rule it from the right. When we got a middle class in Western Europe, United States, turn of the 20th century, we got attempts from the right and attempts from the left. We threaded that needle with the Roosevelts. And we have based ourselves on middle class values ever since. It wasn't. We weren't a middle class country before that. Not even close. Despite our mythology. This century, a global middle class is emerging. About 2 billion in 20, uh, 2000. About 4 billion, so quick doubling, 2020. We're looking at 6 to 7 billion mid-century. Again, not, not my middle class, not the one I grew up in, but the one the world is becoming increasingly accustomed to. So the question is, with single party autocracies emerging on the left or staying on the left, there's your China, or your ethno-nationalist strongmen, Orban, Putin, quite frankly, Trump was a flirtation, Bolsonaro, we're seeing the new guy in Argentina. The question is, who's championing the center today? Biden reaches for it with his foreign policy for the middle class, but it's the American middle class. He's not really promising to do that much about anybody else's middle class. And that's where the Chinese offer something better. They'll say, we can help you get a middle class and help you control it. And that matters because the middle class explosion is going on mostly across East Asia, South Asia, which means the key dyad relationship this century is not the U.S. and China. And it sure as hell isn't over Taiwan, as much as we want to make it over that. That's not the future of the world. Taiwan is not the future of the global system. It is a vestige. It is a tailbone from the Cold War. The real struggle is between China and India, and the reality that China needs to integrate India for its own economic success, because that's how things keep rolling. Globalization, as we look ahead, there are three models out there of integration. There's the European model. It's brilliant. It's complicated. It's bureaucratic. It'll bore you to death. But, you know, remember back to Bob Kaplan telling us not to go into the Balkans in the late 1990s because we'd never get out of there? These crazy people would fight for hundreds of years. Ten years later, they're filming Game of Thrones. This is the most amazing display of soft power in the world. The economic integration model, China, brilliant. Okay, We love to denigrate it. It remains popular, in part because we offer diddly squat. We just got around to offering our first corridor, India, Middle East, Europe. IMEC. Okay. But what they sell along with Belt and Road are security surveillance technologies. So a very different model. The United States, we got a model. It's called Join the Defense Alliance or we will sanction your ass. That's our offering. Be so much like us or kowtow so much to us, we'll put you in a defense relationship or you're likely to be sanctioned pretty much forever because you disappoint us. It is all or nothing for us. We offer you the stick or we offer you the ability to hold our stick. Through line five, this consolidation that's going on right now is not deglobalization. It's just hemispheric integration. And it's because of this. Asia, anchored by China, now consumes most of what it produces. So peak globalization of sending everything to China and having it all sent back to us is over. It doesn't make any sense anymore. The wage differential is gone. They're on par with us now. They're on par with Europe. About the time of the Great Recession, goods flatline in terms of global trade. FBI flatlines in terms of global financial flows. What takes off, what grows 50-fold, digital content flows. McKinsey Institute will tell you now, the bulk, the majority of global trade is in digital content. 
So he's telling me this is deglobalization. You know, it's, it's not deglobalization. If I if I weigh 220 and then go to 250 and then I stop at 250, I'm not losing weight. Okay. So we have a global economy that rose to this very high level of trade and financial flows, and then it flatlined. That's not deglobalization. Okay. Meanwhile, digitalization alters the planet. Creating, in effect, three zones of integration, vertical integration, which I've hinted at before, the west, the east, and the center. Okay, here's our military laydown. Notice how we divide the world similarly. Notice how crowded it is in the middle. That's because you got a hegemon over here, no struggle whatsoever, and quite frankly, you got one over here. What you got in the center are a whole bunch of players. And man, they are devious with one another. They also like to interfere in our elections, all of them. <laughs> okay, we tried to run the center after 9-11, exhausting. We've been backing out ever since under Obama, under Trump. Meanwhile, the Chinese are moving in for the reasons I cited earlier. We think we're going to cut them off at the barn door. We're too late already. Plus, what we're offering is just the old package, defense. Meanwhile, they're bringing their integration to our neck of the woods and succeeding dramatically. This is where Belt and Road is now, all over the place. This is where they're the biggest trade partner. Significant. It's because they view integration differently than we do. We believe in a safe homeland. We want border security. If there are scary things out there, we send people to go kill those scary things. And then we hope the environment gets better on that basis. Our record of we got them is long. Our record of we fixed it is not. China believes in an unsafe homeland based on their history. They believe in creating safe zones. They're creating one right now in Xinjiang. Looks like cultural genocide. They could care less. They lay ghost stones down on a global board. They link them together. That's their view of security. We think we can come in, kill bad actors, secure an environment. They come in, secure the environment. They believe they can prevent bad actors. Top down versus bottom up. So we're all about the gun. They're all about the biometrics. Or as we say in the book, leave the gun, take the biometrics. Packaged with BRI, we're looking at a Trojan horse, China's safe city offering, pioneered by Huawei, biggest producer of telecom equipment, one of the biggest smartphone producers in the world, just got around our semiconductor band, uh, which lasted, I think, about three weeks. Hike Vision, the biggest purveyor of surveillance cameras around the world. So they could track you throughout your day, very omnivalent. They are looking at your face. They are wondering what your emotions are. Their goal, which they're already pioneering inside their country, social credit system, they want you to police yourself based on your score. You got too close to that protest movement yesterday. Your score dropped 20 points. Guess what? You can't go home and see mom and dad on the holidays because you're restricted in inter-provincial travel on the basis of your low score. So next time you avoid, you get away from antisocial people as they're called. You like pro-government posts. And pretty soon you're your own minder, your own jail keeper. They don't have to do anything. You're already in the matrix. That's the negative. Now let's go to the positive why we're best positioned in the Western Hemisphere for making this happen. First, long history <clears throat> of interstate peace. Simple way of measuring border change events. Lots, lots, few. Nothing for us in over a century. Very stable. Second, we're big, and let's be honest, we outspend the next 10. 
We can say how it's never enough, but it should be enough. Expanding resource advantages. We have a lot more water in South America and North and Central America than we need. Asia has a lot more people than it's got water. Not surprisingly, when you have a lot of water left over, we're 13% of the world's population. We got 45% of the fresh water in the Western Hemisphere. We got grain left over. There's the grain you grow. There's the grain you consume. And there's what's left over or what you got to import. The Western Hemisphere has a lot left over. The Eastern Hemisphere couldn't get by without us. Energy, we are self-sufficient. You want to talk about new metals and new minerals? Well, we just found that huge lithium thing in Nevada, lithium triangles down South America. We're fine. We always will be. We are ripe for nearshoring of value chains. There's intra-regional trade, conventionally measured. 70% for Europe. Asia's already ahead of us. Even though we've had NAFTA, USMCA for three decades, we're not keeping up. And we've done nothing to integrate Latin America, which China is pursuing with great vigor. We are starting to wake up to this. But we've been waiting for the Latin American focused president for, I think, let's say 50 years now, going all the way back to Jimmy Carter's talk. We are pre-mixed, okay, as a hemispheric civilization. We were the new world, Amerindian population largely wiped out, inbound settlers who brought in enslaved Africans who encouraged cheap labor from Asia. A very violent, genocidal, ethically dubious integration process, reflecting colonization, European model. The good news is we spent the next half a millennia intermarrying and intermixing, okay? We're like the humans in War of the Worlds. We have earned our right to be good at globalization for all our problems, for all the institutional racism we deal with. We have earned our right to be good at this because we've been mixing forever. So when I tell you whites in America are dropping, I will tell you that's been the case in Latin America for decades. And in reality, all we're doing is matching the hemispheric norm. So hardly an undiscovered country. My favorite thing to note right now, stand-up comedians, what's up with all this stuff where every commercial nowadays has a husband of one race and a wife and another and these perfectly mixed skin kids? What's up with that? Is that woke? Is that ESG? Is that DEI? That's Madison Avenue chasing the fastest consumer group in America because it's the fastest growing population in America. There's less diversity to manage in our neck of the woods. A mere four languages gets you 99% of the population. Religiously, it's stunning. We are overwhelmingly Christian, 80% Catholic. 60% in the Western Hemisphere. Muslim versus Christian in the center. Complexity across Asia. Higher latitudes. We luck out. We got Canada, who are the best. They got Russia, who are the worst. Everybody wants to get on the Arctic Council. I didn't think it was a joke when Trump floated the idea of buying Greenland. Harry Truman offered Denmark. $10 million in gold in 1947 to take it off its hands. Okay. I will remind you, we bought our seat on the Arctic Council, 1867, Seward's Folly. And if I was looking ahead to create the perfect superpower of the 21st century, I would do whatever it took to achieve political and economic union with Canada. We're a perfect match. In terms of economic match on demographics, the age disparity is huge in the center. It's big in Asia, which makes Russia a target. In the Western Hemisphere, we're entirely age appropriate. Ninth, political match on freedom. It's amazing how democratic we are in the West. 
compared to the center and the east. Reality that they're dealing with India's rise in the east. They're dealing with Russia's collapse in the center. We don't have to deal with any of that stuff. And then finally, we got the most attractive brand out there. I got an entire chapter in my book about what's so great about America and why we attract. So let's wrap this up. In the book, I describe it as an Americanist manifesto. We need to start thinking grand strategic terms as Americans, not as an offshoot of Europe. Stars, flags, add them or lose them. Here's the history of this country in seven generations of Barnett's. Joseph Barnett could not afford any stars. All he got was a cut up dead snake. It was gross. His kids started off with 13 stars, doubled them. Jared Barnett added a bunch of stars across a very long life. Harry Barnett, my great grandfather, started out adding stars, lost a bunch of stars, added them back, added even more stars after that. My grandfather, J.E., got five stars across a long life. My dad got two stars across a long life. So far, I got nothing. Bupkis. I'll be the first Barnett to be born and die under the same flag. Barack Obama would be the first president to suffer that fate. Here's the Easter egg on the cover of the book. I'd like a lot more stars. Unreasonable? Here's Europe's history since the mid-1950s. Growing, 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 adding members. Ten in the pipeline. One stupido who left the Brits. By God, do they regret it. Here's the Chinese adding back the Middle Kingdom bits, nibbling like a silkworm. They're not done. They just published a map that said, oops, I think we own a bunch of India. There's the Indians who've been dividing up the subcontinent like we did in North America in our westward expansion, adding states, building states. They added one just nine years ago. And then there's Russia. They lost it all. And they bring back irredentism right out of the 20th century, recovery of sacred lands. So they take hostages, basically, over and over again, because that's what they've done going all the way back to the reign of the czars. You'll tell me the 50 stars on the American flag, sacred. We could never have a different flag. We've had 28 different flags. That's because we added a new star every three to four years for 17 decades until we flatlined. You'll tell me, hey, you can't just add non-contiguous stars. Like, oh, wait, wait a minute, Hawaii and Alaska. You can't just like add a monarchy or an independent sovereign nation. Oh, that would be Hawaii and Texas. Been done. All of it's been done. And the Europeans are doing it now. We should have a lot more stars. So in America's first grand strategy, let me wrap this up. Because I'm asking you to look at the world differently. And I know it. Let me do it by process of elimination. Are you under the impression that we're going to out-integrate China across Asia? Because I don't think you know anything about global economics if you're under that perception. Do you think we're going to out-integrate across the Europe landmass more than the European Union? I doubt it. Do you think we're going to go back and try to fix the Middle East more than all the regional kingpins we activated with our failure? Don't think so. Do you think we're going to be the guys who really bring about the integration of Sub-Saharan Africa? I doubt it. The one place where it makes sense for us to do it is the one place we ignore the most. The one place we punish the most with our antiquated immigration policies and the most catastrophic of our wars, the war on drugs. You look at this map, one third of the population on top, two thirds below, 80% of the wealth on top, 20% below. You may see have, have nots. I see economic opportunity, vast economic opportunity. But it's all about building walls, excuse me, taking down walls and building bridges. So to sum up what I told you, I talked about globalization, how we instigated it, what we triggered with that in terms of climate change, demographic transitions, 
how that helped birth the global middle class that we now fight over in a very different way than we fought in the past, accelerating the regional consolidation that favors the Western hemisphere. Except we got to embrace that. We got to rethink how we treat our neighbors. And that's the book. So, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you've covered uh, what's going on uh, and, and what it means. And what's the now what answer here? What, what what does somebody do with all these ideas? What do you best case scenario? What do you expect to happen? I'm a bit of a cynic. Um, and based on the two reviews I've gotten from middle aged to older white men so far, on the book is that this is not a grand strategy that's going to appeal to people of a certain age and in some instances to people of a certain color because it is a radical acceptance of a very different future that does not revolve around us that does not privilege us that requires us to compete in a world where not until very recently americanization was was assumed you join globalization, you become American. And if you're not, there's something weird and suspicious and even threatening about that. So this is a very hard sell to boomers and Gen Xs. They are busy relitigating the 1960s, right down to Roe v. Wade versus Dobbs. I mean, they're still litigating the 1960s, civil rights, gay rights, all that stuff, Okay. When I talk to millennials who are going to get stuck with this world 2050, okay, they have zero interest in these culture wars. They have very little interest in Republican versus Democrat. They're all about competency versus incompetency, success versus failure, not size of government, functioning of government. Okay. So what I'm trying to do right now is to, is to separate those visions. I mean, we are trapped in a very Cold War perspective. How many times a day do we declare a Cold War in America? Don't ever get a Google alert on that because it'll flood your phone all day long. Notice how everybody in the U.S. government's declared war on China in the last, I don't know, four months by declaring it inevitable. The millennials and Gen Zs are not interested in a multi-decade Cold War with China. They don't get it. They don't see it as being useful. What they're worried about is climate change. What they're worried about is their economic prospects. That bit I told you, where they, they pretty much accept that they're part of a global middle class now, that the old American middle class ain't coming back. Because they've been beat around the head for quite some time on this subject, and it's finally sunk into them. So they want change. Are we going to have to wait, Gen X? And the boomers are still 80 to 85% of Congress. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm going to get reviews on this book that say basically, well, it may happen. And I've already got these kinds. It may happen. I'm not going to be around for it. I don't think we're going to make the effort. Okay. The ones who are stuck being around for it, they're agitating. The Greta Thunbergs, those Montana teenagers that sued over the Constitution's promising of a better environment, we're going to see all sorts of activism. And it's starting to get violent, uh, agitated, you know, very act up, like in the 1980s on AIDS. You're starting to see it on climate. So what do I want to see? I want to break the mold as soon as possible. I want the 51st state. I don't care who it is or how it's achieved. As soon as we break that mold, the conversation changes. Imagination changes. Imagine the card any country could play to China, where the alternative is, well, we'd like your offer, but you know, we're looking into joining the United States in maybe 10 years. And they require us to take Amazon's cloud services. You know, like that seven year deal, deal that Amazon just concluded with El Salvador. That's a win. Okay. So is now the time to demonize our big tech companies? No. No, I'd rather harness them. They're huge assets. So I want to outperform the Chinese everywhere. I want to outperform them first and foremost in Latin America. Okay. I understand this stuff's tough. Okay. The boomers are wedded to the war on drugs. 
because they got us started on all these drugs. And now they want to get us off on all these drugs before they go. God love them. But, you know, a kid who's grown up in the last 30 years, pharmaceuticals have been part of their life from like age two. They're just not fighting this war. And so a lot of this stuff is going to disappear. I'm trying to get the next generation ready for the transformation. And I will tell the boomers, just like Mitt Romney did in many instances, get the hell out of the way because you're not helping. And I Thomas. realized that's a, that's a traitor to my generation argument <laughs> and my race to a certain extent. I, I, I think we could probably go on for a couple more hours. I want to be respectful of your time. I hope you come back to Monterey or come to Monterey. It's been some more time come. With us in, in the future. Uh, thank you again for your time and for all the people who participated in today. Uh, Heather, back to you. Great. Hey, if you want to see more uh, talks like this, look for Apex. We're going to send out registration in the next uh, week or so. So you're going to... Um, be able to sign up for February 20th through the 22nd. That's President's Day week uh, for APEX next year. And it's kind of coming as sooner than you think. This year, we're doing something different. The association, the CHDS Association, will be helping me with the, uh, with the content. So if you have a talk, a novel idea, something interesting to say, uh, please uh, look for the uh, proposals and uh, we'll be in touch with you. Uh, very shortly. Thank you so much for your time today and um, be safe out there, guys, gals. <laughs> <laughs>